everyone, this is Jeff Goose with Stone Temple Pilots, and you're listening to Sound Bakers. Hey there, it's Tommy Royal Blue Mars coming at you today, Sound Vapors Podcast. I got a good one for you. We've got Jeff Goot stopping by from Stone Temple Pilots. We're going to talk about their brand new record that just came out last Friday, Perdita. And we're going to talk about really the making of that record, the production, all those good notes, like liner note stuff. I love that kind of stuff. So we're going to get him in here. We're going to talk about that. And we're actually going to get an update on how he's doing medically or physically. Because, uh, as you know, or may not know, that they canceled their... They had a tour coming up where they were going to do like a two-hour performance, like an evening with. And it was going to feature, you know, the, the brand new record that is uh, very much acoustic bass and has all these great instruments and, and musicians on it. They were going to play those and then reimagine some old STP songs So on a personal note, I was very bummed by this because I really wanted to see that. So hopefully they can get that rescheduled. But I got a treat. I got a top 10 for you. And that top 10 is going to, it's not going to be a Stone Temple Pilots favorite top 10 list. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting on that because the truth is, the truth is I can't, I can't get through it. And so, cause you guys, well, people that know me personally know that STP is tops they know it's very well at the top of my list of favorite bands of all time i'm very very familiar with the entire catalog every single song every single word every guitar string i've i've lived on all of it so putting that together has actually been a little bit tougher than i thought because they uh they put out so much great music so this is not that but what this is fine folks is a top 10 acoustic guitar based song list so this is basically in honor of their brand new record Padita that's out like I said it's a it's kind of like an acoustic guitar based it's not just I mean there's other stuff but you know what I mean right kind of laid back so this is the list this is the list today guys but right before we do that I want to make a, a PSA so I know that many many hardcore STP fans they're going to get mad at my list. And I know you guys are going to, you know, I get it. I get it. I'm a diehard too. I understand. But if you're going to kind of come at me on social media, can you make sure that you, you know, jot down three or four or five? You know what? Actually, no, no, no. The gloves are off. So I'm not being nice. If you're going to dispute my list, you got to give me 10. I want to see 10, your top 10 acoustic bass STP songs. That's the only way I'm going to accept it. It's the only way I'm going to respond. If you give me your top 10, there we go. Then we can have a discussion about it. So uh, just don't say mine sucks. You got to give me a list. Actually, you can say it sucks. That's okay. But uh, I want to hear your opinion. I want to hear what you got to say. I want to hear your list. I want to see what that looks like. So you know where to do it. T-O-M-M-Y, M-A-R-Z, B-A-N-D, Tommy Mars Band. Those are my handles. Twitter, Instagram, <laughs> that's where it is. So uh, yeah, come give me a shout, man. I appreciate it. Okay, let's get on this list. Number 10. Number 10 comes off of the 2018 Stone Temple Pilots release. I really dug the album. I really dug it. And I dug the acoustic bass songs that were on there. So Red and Blues, it was the last song on the record. I just dug it because there it something happens when they go into the, the, the pre-chorus and then the chorus. It just, I don't know, it's a great, it's a great album closer, but it's also a great acoustic bass song. That's why it's number 10 on my list. Number nine. Okay, let the the fun fest begin. I have it number nine because it's not my favorite acoustic bass STP song, but I still love it. I still love it. So it's Creep. I, w- I want to put an asterisk here. I'm putting an asterisk next to this one. You know why? Part of the reason is on some songs, I may have heard them too much. So it's like, I acknowledge that Sweet Child of Mine, Guns N' Roses, is one of the great greatest GNR songs ever made. I acknowledge it. As soon as that first note comes on in my car, radio station, whatever, it's an instant turn. Instant. I think I've just heard it too many times. Do you get where I'm coming from? Do you get where I'm coming from? I mean, that I mean, 
you feel like that too, right? On certain songs, it's like a Aerosmith. Any pretty much any '80s Aerosmith song, it's an instant turn. Or like early '90s, I I, I turn it right away because I just heard it too much. Same with Bon Jovi. Gosh, I sound like awful. I know, but that's how it is. Maybe with Creep. Now it's not an instant turn because I love SDP that much, so I still listen to it. I just don't enjoy it as much as I did. Like when I first got the the core cassette, right? Well, it wasn't easier to turn, but I listened to it. I still loved it. But the other asterisk here, I'm writing a second asterisk is with Creep. For me, it's the second version that they recorded where Scott kind of goes for it more in the second verse and Eric does more like a roll thing, that type of thing. So it's the second version of Creep, the one that's not on core. So that's that's number nine on my list. Number eight, I'm going back to the, the 2018 release. Thought she'd be mine. I am really such a fan. I love what... I love the production on that, on both of those songs I mentioned from that record. And then I love Jeff's voice on it. I thought he did a great job. And I told Jeff this before our interview, I was listening to that song. It's one of those ones I like to, you know, mine in the morning. I like, I like it. I just like to sing along with it. It's just got such a good song sound. So that's number eight. Thought she'd be mine. Number seven. Oh, let's get in a Shangri-La. Okay. So wonderful. It's just a sweet sound, you know? It's these songs from, like, like that album that, like, I mean, you miss Scott with every song, especially if you're, you know, you've been a fan for so long. But something about these songs like that, um, it makes me, makes, them, makes me miss them even more. But uh, I won't get too deep in it. But number seven, that's wonderful. Number six, it is a brand new one. Yes, I'm putting a brand new song on this list because... Let me just tell you. So the brand new album, it's 10 tracks. It's all acoustic based. And I do like the album. I really do. But there's a song on there that stood out to me the very first time through. So I listened to the whole record and I was like, wow, that's pretty good. But there's this one song that I made a note. I always make kind of a, I take notes. You know, I take notes. I, I, I made a, a note for myself. Don't forget this song. And it's She's My Queen. Seriously, go listen to this song. There's something so special about this song musically, I, vocally, everything that's going on with it. It is my absolute favorite song from the brand new album. It's not even close. It's not even close. I've been going back to three or four of the songs because, like I said, you know, this is something that I do. I'm sure a ton of you do the same thing. You get a record, you you listen to it, but you start to pick out, you know, four songs that you keep going back to, even on the best records. I mean, everybody knows that Purple is what I consider a, a, a all-timer. I mean, a complete all-timer. All timer. And I do listen to the whole thing. But if I'm pressed for time or if I know that I, I want to, I go to certain songs first and there's, well, that record's different. That's probably six or seven. But, you know, I go to five or six songs, five songs that I go to in order that I know I, I have to listen to if I'm going to listen to Purple. You know, that's that's how that goes. So on this brand new one, on Perdita, She's My Queen is that song for me. In fact, it's becoming such the song for me that I put it on repeat and I just keep listening to that song over and over. I like it so much, so I, I shot it up the list. I mean, originally when I was putting this together, I was like, okay, I'm going to put that number 10 because it almost seems crazy that it's that high. But now here we go. It's not even a week, half a week. I've listened to it so much that uh, I'm humming it, I'm singing it, I'm thinking about it. I think I'm going to ask her on a date. She's My Queen. Number six, let's get into the meat potatoes. Number five, go back to purple. Let's go to Pretty Penny. That's my number five. That's pure acoustic STP. You know, man, oh gosh. You know, it's like just everything about that song. And it reminds me of that time, that sound of that album. Because, you know, there's those distorted guitars. It's great. It's a great guitar record. But it also has those moments. Pretty Penny, pr Pretty Penny is one of those moments. Okay, let's get to number four. Number four is another one of those songs like Wonderful off the same album, Hello, It's Late. I almost I almost felt like it wasn't going to be on here. I didn't know if it was... I didn't know if it fell into this category. But, you know, I kept... I listened to it a few times. I was like, yeah, it, it does. Because I want it to be on the list because it's such a great song. And it, it, I think it's one of those... I think it's one of those songs that really showcased... You know, Scott Whelan's talent, too. I mean, all the songs do, but that one, I don't know, that one really seems to grab me. 
So, okay, so that's number four. Top three coming, but I want to hold on a sec. So, I want to say a couple things I did not include on this list. I wanted to take songs from studio releases, you know, full albums. So there's a couple other thing that they things that they've done that easily could have been on the list. Um, I love their cover of Dancing Days. Uh, I mean, you probably if you've been to a concert, you heard you know Andy Warhol. You've heard some of these songs. I just wanted you know one one of those albums. I wanted the song to be on there, and it was hard to do that because originally when it, one of the first songs I wrote down was uh, the acoustic version of Cracker Man on the Unplugged. I love that. I listen to that. I listen to that more than I listen to the version encore. It keeps like I, I feel like I keep saying encore. That version that is on the album core. Uh, I listen to the, the acoustic version of Cracker Man even more. I love it. So I just want to make that point that none of those songs are on this list. They could have been, but it would have made it even tougher. I mean, you know, like Red and Blues would have been off. Creep would have been off. I would have been offed for keeping Creep off of there. All right, number three. Number three. Okay. Kitchenware and candy bars. It's the outro to purple. Well, sort of the outro. You know what I'm saying. 12 Graces Melodies, man. Um, this is this is one of those songs, you know, when you, you end the album and you're like, back then, back then, you know, you're talking about mid-90s. You're like, well, are you really ending an album with a song? Like, yes, they are. And thank goodness they did. It is such a special, special song. And if they ever, if you ever caught them playing this back in the day, playing it live, consider yourself lucky to see Scott Whelan sing this, sing this live. That is, gosh, that is special. You know, it's weird. I think this is the song on when they were on the Family Values tour. I think it's this where he says, turn those lights, those white lights off. If anybody knows this, please uh, send me a message. I think, and you know, this is 20 years ago that I'm going off of memory, but I swear he was like, he was mad about the lights. And after he goes on a rant about how they're not Ricky Martin, man, they're trying to do Pink Floyd or something like that. It was, some, if I'm remembering it correctly. Anyways, I think Kitchenware Candy Bars was that song. Correct me if I'm, well, just tell me. Let, let me know if you know the answer to that. There's some SDP trivia. All right, number two. I mentioned earlier that I didn't want to include a song because I didn't know if it fit within the, the confines of this, you know, this list, acoustic based, not so much laid back, but acoustic based songs. So then I decided I have to put it on here. I mean, this will be on my all time top STP list in general. And I was going to do the weenie thing. I was going to, this is number, this, both of these two are number one is what I was going to do. I decided against it. I'm not going to be a weenie because I got to be serious on this. This is Stone Temple friggin' Pilots, man. I can't can't be a weenie on this. So I decided to number it. Number two, Sour Girl. You know, this could be number one. It could be number one at any time. Line in the sand. Sour Girl, number two on my list. I know you've heard it. You probably heard it a lot. Pause me. Go back. Go listen to it right now. What a great song. Now, a little bit with me on this one is, so I was living down in Atlanta when this, Atlanta, Georgia, when this this came out. And this is one of those theme songs. I mentioned on an episode, it might have been the last episode, where I was saying, like, you know, your life is a series of episodes and you have, like, theme music. This was my theme music for so many days down there. So many days. I remember the smell of my car. I remember the the smell of the city and that, good smells. And like, you know, just the way I had this convertible Mustang, man, and it was badass. And it burned a little oil. It burned a little heavy on the oil, but not in a bad. It didn't smell really bad, but it just kind of had a distinct smell to it. And I can still remember how that smells. So when I hear, if I, anytime I put on the number four record, I, I kind of get that. I can almost smell that smell. I can feel that warm Atlanta wind, you know, blowing in, in January, you know what I mean? Cause it, it was, it was not so cold down there, that kind of thing. So that was definitely a, a part of that soundtrack. The biggest song of that soundtrack though is by the city. And I will admit, sometimes you let your emotional connection to it, you know, dictate how you're going to do things. Yes, that is happening here. So number one is the song Atlanta. But it's not just what you think. It's not just because I was living in Atlanta. It, it really wasn't that. 
it's just, it was a special song. So the first time again, it was almost like Kitchen Weir Candy Bars. They ended the album with this song and it's, you ask anybody, go ask any diehard STP fan. They'll tell you, they'll tell you how special this song is. It is such a great song. And when Scott Whelan passed, I know the guys got together in their studio and they were talking about the tracks and they, they pulled up this, this song and they isolated Scott's vocals. You know, I was so thankful that they did that just to hear how I, you already know how special it was and how special he was, but Holy smokes, man, when you hear in like the acapella version of what he did on this song, I mean, it really, it was a thing of beauty. And the whole song is a thing of beauty. You know, I, I've mentioned so many times, I've written words, how much I admire the the songwriting style and skills of the DeLeo brothers. And I've always mentioned Dean is actually absolutely positively top 10 for me, all time guitar players. Uh, in fact, I mean, Rob's, he's up there as bass players. I mean, go listen to the run and tripping. Go, go at, uh, on that course. If you need to know what I'm talking about kills me. That's one of the things. I'm not a bass player, but I'll like finger bass it when that comes on. That's, that's how much I love it. Um, and then just, you know, I've, I've mentioned like Eric Kretz has such a distinct sound, the way he plays the drums. And a lot of people have tried to do that thing. And we call it like when I'm in the studio, if we're working with stuff, I, you know, Hey, let's go into the STP groove. It's just that groove. Eric Kretz just, he just has that groove. And anyway, the, the, the band is so special to me, but this song it's one of those songs that is just like, um, if I'm in a bad mood and this comes on, I might still be in a bad mood, but I'll be in a better bad mood. You know what I mean? It's like, it has such, it's a somber song. It it has that feel to it, but there's something about it that just, it's a calming. It's just, that's what it is. It's such a calming presence. It's such a calming sound to me. And, uh, yeah, man, it's one of my go-tos absolutely positively. When I get around to that that top 10, it might have to be a STP top 20, to be honest with you. When I get around to it, though, those two songs, Atlanta, Sour Girl, definitely going to be on there. It's weird because Purple, I would say Purple is my favorite STP record all time. But man, I listen to number four a lot. Hmm. Crazy how that was. Okay, so there it is, my top 10 STP acoustic-based songs. Let me know what you think. I'd like to see what you think on that. I'd like to see here your top 10. I want to see how different it is, and I want to see if I miss something or or if you think uh, I'm completely crazy. You're probably right about that. Okay, let's get to this interview. I'm going to bring in Jeff. We're going to talk about the brand new record. It's going to be good. Stay tuned. So, hey, man, welcome to the show. Good to have you. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, so you've got uh, got the new record. just came out Friday. February 7th, Perdita, 10 tracks. So uh, how's, how's it feeling, man? Feeling pretty good releasing a, a record like this, this diverse, right? Yeah, it was, it was, making that record was, uh, was very therapeutic, you know, to get a lot of things out and um, kind of share a lot of things with the world that you, know, you normally don't share. So uh, it was definitely one of those uh, moments. Uh, you know, we were just going to write a few songs and record like a handful of them and put on EP. But uh, once we got in the studio, we found out that <laughs> we had a lot more to say, so we just kind of kept going. Cool, man, cool. Well, the the idea of recording of a more kind of laid-back acoustic record, um, w- was that like always in the plans to do that, or did it just kind of start to happen? Uh, I think the brothers kind of wanted to do it for a while. They had been talking about it here and there, uh, especially Robert. He, you know, he, had, he had the idea of bringing extra musicians and really you know, dabbling in different styles and, and um feels and different things like that so I, I, I mean you know you listen to it and no two songs really sound the same when it comes to where you know the music so just all the instruments and the and all these great musicians um so that was always kind of in their plan to do that or did it just kind of morph into like hey we want to bring in a flute we want to bring in you know these different cool instruments yeah yeah i think i think uh some some of them they had they did what they wanted and some of them kind of like hey we should get this or we should get that uh, definitely strings was always there uh always the idea of piano and organ or whatever, whatever the song called for so um yeah, I, w- I wasn't really there. I didn't go in on the extra musician days when they were recording, except for the, the background singers. So uh, <clears throat> I live right by the studio, so they can call me up any time. But um, if they need me. But uh, 
I kind of, you know, I, I, I was, I was pleasantly surprised every time, every day when they would send me the tracks with the new stuff on it. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I have, I have that as a question for you, and, and now that you mention that, so. What was your reaction when you started to get like these musically, you're getting these tracks. What was your first reaction when you started hearing this stuff? Well, it kind of took me back to how I started, you know, I was always, I've, I was always a guitar player since I was six, you know, so I didn't really, I didn't really put down the guitar and concentrate on singing until, um, until 92 when, when SCP even came out. So, um, yeah, it, it was, you know, it really took me back to, to, uh, my roots and, you know, my, my dad's record collection of, you know, Simon and Garfunkel and the Carpenters and, 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 you know, John Denver and all those things that I grew up listening to, Gordon Lightfoot and, and, and yeah. uh, you know, it felt, felt very comfortable. So I just kind of, kind of fell in where, uh, what, to what felt best and where I thought the song needed the most. Definitely. Well, did you, did you find it easy to write, like, as far as like the lyrical content, was there, like, was it an easy time for you? Were you kind of inspired by anything, or how, how was that process for you? Well, you know, um, I tend to people watch and, and try to put myself in other people's shoes in different situations. So uh, it, it was definitely a lot of a lot of things to draw on, a lot of feelings and emotions that I could get out, um, whether they be personal or or you know about someone else. So you know, it, it was uh, it, it, it was it, it wasn't. It's never, not, never difficult to write with Stone Temple Pilots because they're so good, you know, and, and the music sure. takes you somewhere. So, you know, you just got to kind of figure out what the song needs the most and, and uh, stay true to that. And that's, that's uh, kind of how I approached it. Gotcha. Well, like, is there was there any difference between, like, say, this record and the 2018 release uh, in terms of writing the songs? I mean, is that process the same or do you guys jam out like kind of songs and then you're come up with melodies and lyrics in your head? Or um, how does that look from a, a songwriting standpoint from you and the band? Yeah, this this uh, this record kind of happened more uh, the same way that. Um, uh started letting go kind of happen uh, or uh thought should be mine you know like they, um they would come in and sometimes they would have the, the music the, the music down with the melody um and sometimes you know robert had a lot of lyrics and they both had song names that they would come in with so uh you know it's just they, they would kind of steer it in, the, in a direction and, and i would uh get what they were picking up on and try to personalize it as much as i could cool man cool um yeah and yeah, just for the record man that the 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 new album, I'm I'm loving it. Uh, the 2018 release, love that one. Uh, and it's funny you said that. Uh, you mentioned "Thought She'd Be Mine" because I was just listening to that this morning. It's just such a great song, man. And I love your vocal performance on that specific song. I just want to throw that out there, man. I love it. Love it. Hey, thank you, bro. I appreciate that, man. Cool, cool. So, um, you you mentioned when you got in there, you guys kind of started, you know, writing and and recording. Are there? Because so there's ten tracks on this record, but is there? Um, are there more? Tracks that you guys actually recorded that did not make the album? Uh, no, no, we were because we were only supposed to do like six songs. So when we got in there, we started recording, and while we were recording, you know, they would be showing me other songs that they had, <laughs> song ideas that they had. So, um, yeah, uh, they just kept going. So once we got to ten, we're like, listen, we need to stop, or we're we're gonna have a double album of all of <laughs> right. <laughs> So we decided to cut it off at 10 and just kind of finish those up. It's kind of how we approached it. But I'm sure they have a million songs by now. You know, we haven't recorded right. in a year or so. Well, I think the the thing is with a band like yours is you, so you've got like such great vocal range. And obviously everybody knows how those guys write music. I mean, they just... They just shit songs, you know what I mean? They just have so many songs. So yeah. I feel like a a band like yours, you could you could legitimately put out a double record of like one side rock the other side acoustic you know like i think that's always the danger with people like you that have so many songs you know uh which actually would be cool coincidentally yeah. that'd be a cool concept yeah yeah um the writing process is always is always one of those times where where you're reflecting on a lot of things that you go through or you see other people going through um uh while you're not recording and while you're recording you have to you have to you know go back on those things and really draw from from each what each, what each experience told you and how it can fit into the vibe of a song, and, and I just try to pick the right one to, to match up with the right song, you know, and I really just see what the music's telling me. For sure, yeah. So, um, did you record this? Like the majority of it was at Bomb Shelter, right, or or was it somewhere else? Uh, most of it was at Eric's. Yeah, I did all my recording at Eric's, and most of it was done at Eric's. But uh, some of it was done at Robert's studio. He has a studio too. Um, so. I wasn't there for that stuff. That's kind of when you did his bass and other things. So, um, 
couple other things. Uh, so did you guys uh, wind up like self-producing this or did somebody, because I actually was looking for it. I didn't see who produced the album and like who engineered it. Yeah, no, it was produced by, by, by the band and uh, Ryan Williams engineered it and mixed it. So uh, yeah, it was like it was very family oriented, you know, doing, doing it at Eric's house where his family, you know, they're in the building right next door. So the, they pop in every now and then. It's very laid back and um, yeah, it's a great work environment for sure. Cool, cool. Well, hey, man, I'm like, going through this, I've been through it a dozen times. Um, I think, I mean, you're a music guy. You know how it is. Like, you get a record, I, you listen to the whole thing, but then you start getting those favorites, right? You start going back to those those tracks. You know, for me, Sunburst, I didn't know the time is a great one. But for me, She's My Queen, man. That's the one everybody needs to hear that. So anybody listening to this podcast right now, like, pause us and go listen to She's My Queen. That song rips, man. Do you have any kind of that stand out for you or, or maybe personally special to you? Um, yeah, Sunburst is definitely one of those. Because um, uh, uh, that was a, it was a big moment for me when the, when the, when the, when the lyrics clicked, you know, and kind of everything worked together. Um, it was kind of a moment. So, so that was, uh, nice. that was that's, definitely, that's definitely one of the songs that, was, uh, that sticks out for me. Um, yeah, I fell in love with it right away. And, it's, and when the lyrics all came to me, it, it was uh, definitely a, a gift from somewhere. So uh, it kind of wrote itself, you know. So um, and I've been up all night trying to trying to write something. When you're trying, when you're trying and, and it's not going well, you know, you kind of put it aside. And the sun was coming up, and it, you know, the sun being shooting over my building, I could just there was something to that. And being that I was writing a song called Sunburst, it kind of just all came together in the moment. Nice, man. Thanks. That's that's a cool story. I love it. So, unfortunately, you guys had to cancel. You guys had, like, this acoustic tour planned. Um, I, I guess the, the thing is, did you have your surgery, or are you having that, or how are you feeling? Yeah, yeah, I'm healing and uh, resting and doing all those wonderful things that come with that. Yeah, <laughs> that uh, rehab and all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all that physical therapy and fun stuff so uh hopefully we can we can uh reschedule for later we have some other tours that we're doing uh going to australia with bush and lives and then uh doing north america with uh nickelback after that so it's pretty much going to take up a lot of time so uh hopefully we can fit it in between or or do it after after the nickelback tour but uh, we're hoping to get that going because it's you know it was uh really going to be something special you know uh two hours of extra musicians and you know strings and piano and it's just going to be a smorgasbord of wonderfulness so <laughs> you know, uh, yeah yeah hopefully we can get that going yeah i really hope you guys can so i just some some personal questions man so what what kind of uh what kind of stuff are you listening to lately oh man lately i've been listening to uh i've been going back to the, the, the classic stuff uh, that i love you know like pink floyd and things like that i listen to a lot of jeff buckley um had his records. I like to spin those with, with some wine at night. You know, those are, those are nice. one of my favorites. So cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I just spent. I've been more digging into the things that I grew up on lately. Like, just kind of going rehashing some of the some of the stuff that originally. Um, and you fall in love with music, you know, Simon and Garfunkel, things like that. Cool. Well, hey, man, I hate to put you on spot, but can you give me three three singers, man? Your three favorite front guys, front men, front women, three of them. Ooh, Freddie Mercury. Definitely would definitely be in there. Um, let's see, uh, Joe Cocker would be in there. Ooh, Elvis okay. Presley. Ah, Elvis. You know what's weird? I mean, he's the king, and everybody knows who he is. But I feel like he doesn't get any love anymore, and it kind of pisses me off because it's Elvis, dude. He got he got so much for so long. I think maybe uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Back. Could be. Back. That's true. Payback time, right? I don't know. I just went down the Graceland for the first time a year last year, and uh, it was like life changing, dude. It was awesome to be at Graceland. Have you ever been there? I've never been. I've been to Memphis, but I didn't get a chance to hit up Graceland. So uh, I would love to do it. Yeah, I mean, his voice was was amazing. You know, the baritone and just uh, yeah. Okay, so that was my interview with Jeff Goot, frontman for Stone Temple Pilots. I hope you enjoyed it. I liked hearing about some of the backstories of making the making of the album. I love all that kind of stuff. That's why I ask those questions because it's like a, it, you don't, I don't ever really get to hear these kind of things. You know, I don't read it in print that much. I like to hear some of these things. I mean, you get making of, but some of the backstories and getting like to hear his, his explanation when he wrote the song Sunburst, that was pretty cool, right? That was cool. Him having the song named and then kind of being up all night trying to 
get the words, you know, trying to trying to write this song, and then the sun comes up and it kind of beams through, you know, the window, and boom, there you go. You know, you write the song. That's that's what I'm after. That's what I'm looking for. I love that. So I really hope you enjoyed that part. I was very, um, I was excited when he kind of went into that. That was really cool. So um, make sure you go get this this album. I'll go check it out. Go give it a listen. Uh, Perdita came out, what, Friday, February 7th. So it's been out for a few days. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good. I, I really like it. And uh, I would suggest, obviously, you know, you, you heard my list at the beginning of the show. Uh, I talked about it with him as well is, you know, she's my queen. That's, that's my favorite song from the album. So if anything, go give that one a listen, fare thee well, you know, that's kind of been everywhere. So maybe you've heard that one too. Uh, yeah, go get, go check it out. Go give it a listen. It's pretty cool. You can check them out on all their stuff, all their pages, Stone Temple Pilots. I believe their Twitter's STP band. Uh, go give them a follow, go say hello, tell them Tommy Mars sent you. And, uh, yeah, man. Uh, like I said earlier, if you want to reach out to me, you can find me on Twitter. I'm very, I'm probably active the most on Twitter and then Instagram, but the handles are the same, man. You can find me there, Facebook, it's all the same thing. T-O-M-M-Y-M-A-R-Z-B-A-N-D, Tommy Mars Band. If you're watching this on, on YouTube, uh, if you can do me a solid and whoosh, whoosh, could you uh, subscribe and then uh, turn on your notification because we got some really cool interviews coming up. Uh, just great artists talking about the records, kind of like this, going through these kind of things. Sometimes we catch them when they're just coming into the uh, uh, the cycle of an album release. Sometimes they're on tour. Sometimes they're coming off of tour. So you never know what you're going to get. You're going to get some cool behind the scenes stuff. I can tell you that much. You'll get some cool stuff like that. Uh, and, and if you, know, you, you want to go check out our back catalog, we've got a ton of cool interviews up right now. Uh, the last several uh, have been just great, great artists. You know, we had a couple of mics. We had Mike from Incubus, Mike from Allison Chains, Jeff from Pumpkins. Uh, we had a great, great one with Coco Riley. So, um, yeah, man, we've got some really cool stuff out there. So go check those out. Stay tuned though, because we have some really cool artists coming up. I'm excited for you to see these and, and hear these. So go give them, uh, give them a shot when they come out. All right, man, I am out of here. My coffee is pretty low. So that means it's closing time. So this is uh, this is Tommy Mars signing off for Sound Vapors. Have a good day. See. You. Thanks, Tommy. Appreciate it, bro.